We have no time. Mark, there's just a history and physical. There's no consent form, no labs. Look, Ken, I know you want to be thorough here, but we have no time. Here's the story. 19-year-old girl, previously healthy, now dying. Needs an emergency craniotomy 10 minutes ago. That's all I've got. Let's roll. I had met Carla 28 minutes earlier in the emergency room. She was a beautiful UMass history major with a life of promise in front of her. Only the moment I laid eyes upon her, she wasn't living, she was dying with little time left. Her surgery would be challenging and to the untrained eye, it appeared that maybe she was sleeping or snoring off a hangover, which is what her roommates had thought. In reality, a blood vessel deep in her brain had ruptured. Her surgery would be challenging, but what was even more daunting were the hospital rules and protocols that I had to adjust, I had to bypass, in order to get her to the operating room before it was too late. Most hospitals nowadays can get a patient from the emergency room to the operating room in as little as an hour. And that's fast, but Carla didn't have an hour. And every minute I saved may be the difference between Carla speaking and being silent, eating or being fed. I couldn't just steamroll her into the operating room, breaking all the hospital rules, but I had to get my music box to play just a little bit faster, twisting that handle without breaking it. I looked at Carla's heart monitor. Her blood pressure was rising and her heart rate was dropping, a deadly sign of increased intracranial pressure. This girl is dying right now. Let's try to save her. Grasping the severity of the situation, anesthesia granted me an immediate pass to the operating room. My first taste of elite performance came in the high school and college wrestling mats. And now I'm a wrestling coach for the Princeton Youth Wrestling Association. And when new wrestlers come to join me, I say to the wrestlers, I want to explain to you what wrestling is. What is wrestling? It's, it's a physical chess match, I tell the young wrestlers. I say it's, it's a struggle for control with very fixed rules of engagement. And as Dr. Zinzer has told you, not only are you all athletes in this room, I think we're all wrestlers. Aren't we all struggling with something in our life? Whether it's on the tennis court, or it's in the boardroom negotiating a, a good deal, or it's trying to break a bad habit, or fight an addiction. I think we're all wrestling with something in our life. And what my youth wrestling coach taught me when I was young is that a dedicated, true wrestler is always a student, always continuously trying to improve. And wrestling is a sport that teaches one about physical dominance. Neurosurgery is something that taught me cognitive dominance. Cognitive dominance is a term coined by the U.S. Army that Dr. Zinzer works with a number of the soldiers on. And what it is is enhanced situational awareness to make rapid and accurate decisions under stressful conditions with little decision-making time. Here are two windows into my world, one years ago and one present day. Now to the average person, wrestling and brain surgery don't go together. But to me, they're woven in the fabric of my life. This is something I did many times in high school and college, a headlock. And this is something I use many times every day a head wrap. A head wrap, what does it do? It protects a wound. It protects somebody that's had a craniotomy. But it's a symbol that someone has had major brain surgery. 
And I can tell you, it's placed on amazing saves and horrific tragedies. Just in the last two years, my partner, Dr. Josepher, wrapped the head of a young 18-year-old boy in this hospital who was struck in the head with a line drive, had an epidural hematoma, he was dying, the clot was evacuated, and Dr. Josepher wrapped his head, and that boy now is going off to college. And I, on another fateful morning, wrapped the head of another unlucky 18-year-old boy. And as I wrapped his head on Christmas morning, I knew this was the last thing his parents would see before we called the organ donor team. Very sad day. My mentor once told me, the head wrap mark is the only thing they see. It's the only thing families see. So make it perfect. The head wrap is the only thing they see. If you're struggling in surgery, get more exposure. Mark, measure millimeters and miles. Always leave a drain. Never cut what you can't see. It's these pearls that are branded into a neurosurgeon resident's mind through the seven years of training that I carry with me. And they're very important lessons. They keep you out of trouble and they save lives. Neurosurgery is a calling, a religion. It's not something you do part time. And like any religion, it has basic principles that you need to follow to stay out of trouble and save lives. Never cut what you can't see. Six simple words, the first rule of neurosurgery. I'll never forget them. I was peering in the observer microscope watching Dr. Peter Janetta perform a microvascular decompression, a third year medical student visiting the University of Pittsburgh. He's dissecting delicate membranes over the cortical vessels, critical vessels going to the brainstem. I was nervous. He was not. And his next move astonished me. He began to hum. How does someone do that? How does someone who is doing an extremely complex life and death maneuver with razor sharp micro scissors over the brainstem be so relaxed that they actually can hum. To him it was simple as he was doing it he said Mark never cut what you can't see. He was following the automatic rules that he had set in place to execute perfectly. Now not everything always goes perfectly in neurosurgery but if you follow that rule you are going to set yourself up for success. Did you know that in the past 75 years, the two greatest advances in neurosurgery are not fancy techniques or new medications, two simple improvements, illumination and magnification. The, the surgeons of yesteryear were just as good as we are, maybe better, but they couldn't see with their naked eye what we see now with a microscope and xenon lighting. This is a Harvey Cushing using a, a weak headlamp, one of the fathers of neurosurgery. So what can we learn from that? The two greatest advances, illumination and magnification. Never cut what you can't see. Well, in my practice, Princeton Brain and Spine Care, we just celebrated our 10th year as an out of plan practice. Does anyone know what an out-of-plan practice is? We basically fired all the insurance companies. Why did that happen? Well, five years into my career, I was very unhappy. I wasn't able to practice the kind of medicine I wanted to. I grew up following my grandfather around carrying his black bag on house calls. I would see what kind of relationship he would have with his patients, unrushed, unhurried took all the time needed to grow that relationship and have that bond. And I dreamed of having that relationship when I went into medicine. 
only the first five years, I didn't experience that. It was rush, rush, rush. See more patients, do more surgeries, get moving, file all this paperwork. And as I was spending more and more time doing paperwork and more and more time rushing through things, I was very depressed. And I thought about it and I thought about it and I thought about it. I couldn't think of an answer for that. How can I practice medicine the way I want? And the answer was right in front of me. Don't sign the insurance contract. By not signing the insurance contract, by signing the insurance contract, I made the insurance company my customer. And they were my barrier to my patient. If I didn't sign the insurance contract, my patient was my customer. There was no barrier between me and my patient. Now a lot of people said that was crazy. A lot of people said it's not going to work. But I believed in it because I wanted to have that great doctor-patient relationship. And Ten years later, it's worked out very beautiful, beautifully for me. And I can tell you, I found my love for medicine again. Never cut what you can't see. So as you're sitting here tonight, what issue or problem are you struggling with that you haven't shined enough light on or you haven't magnified up on to really decide what needs to happen? It, the anatomy of your problem may be right in front of you and you haven't been able to solve it. And if you can't come up with an answer, consider somebody in the observer microscope side. Get a consultant or an advisor or ask for advice. It's that pooling of intellectual resources which gives you cognitive dominance, right? Enhanced situational awareness in order to make rapid and accurate decisions under stressful conditions with limited decision-making time. Never cut what you can't see. Rule number two, always leave a drain. The posterior fossa is one of the hardest areas to operate in neurosurgery. It's a small area in the back of the head, the shape of a tangerine. And it's housed by very thick bone and it's shrouded by critical blood vessels that go to the brain stem. And even neurosurgeons get nervous when they operate in the posterior fossa. The scan you see here is a tumor in the posterior fossa of a young boy. Now, the surgery to operate on this tumor is challenging. But the number one thing you have to do before you start this operation is you need to place a drain. What does a drain do? Well, we talked a little bit about increased intracranial pressure. Pressure inside the head building up is dangerous and deadly. And normally, Intracranial pressure is higher than atmospheric pressure, just a few millimeters of pressure higher. But with a tumor, it's a lot higher. So the pressure inside the head is higher than the atmospheric pressure. Well, what happens when you open something that's in a lower atmosphere, higher atmospheric pressure into the atmosphere, like a Coke can that's shaken up? Psh, all over you. Well, that's exactly what happens if you go in and you start operating on this tumor. You have to place a safety valve a pop-off valve, which gives you control of the surgical microenvironment. So what do we have to do first is we have to make a separate incision on the side of the head and pass a little catheter into the center of the brain and drain off some fluid. That's our pop-off valve. It gives us control of the environment. But it's annoying. You know, this is a long operation and you want to get to it. And you want to get to the meat of the case, you know, the sexy stuff. Neurosurgeons kind of have a sick concept of sexiness. This is sexy for me. You want to get to the meat of the case. It's a long operation. You had a, maybe a long night before. You want to get to work. But you cannot. You must place a drain first. And if you place a drain, then you have control of your surgery and things will, are likely to go well. So what kind of a drain did I place in my practice as we began to expand over the last 10 years? We were servicing a number of hospitals. We had new staff coming on, new doctors coming on. How could we keep uniformity in the practice? We instituted a five o'clock phone call where every single day at five o'clock, 
Everybody that takes care of a patient at our practice picks up the phone and talks about all the patients that are in the hospital. We go over every single patient. At 9 o'clock on Sunday nights, every single patient, it's 10 minutes. And while by doing that, no test goes unchecked, no lab goes unchecked, and no patient goes undiscussed. It's a very simple practice that we instituted. And sometimes I just don't want to do it. It's the end of a long day or it's Sunday night and I want to veg out on the couch or have another glass of wine with my wife. But I get up, I pick up the phone and all my partners do and all our practice gets on the phone and discuss all the patients. And it's kept us out of trouble and it inculcates great communication within our organization. So I want to ask you, as you're here tonight, focusing on learning, focusing on improving yourselves, what drains have you placed? What are the safety valves that you have in your house, in your business, that keep you out of trouble? The mundane, ordinary things that have to get done to make things go right. Let's zoom in a little bit more. How about your health? What about that history and physical you've been putting off? What about that exercise, that 30 minutes of exercise or eating healthy? What good are you to your family, your loved ones, if you haven't put in that safety valve of exercise and eating healthy and getting a checkup? Always place a drain. You know, it's funny, whenever I tell the story about Carla, everybody wants to hear the technical side of the surgery, what happened in the surgery. The fact of the matter is, Carla was saved more by negotiation than surgical technique. You can use cognitive dominance in many ways. Effective leaders, when faced with a challenging situation, can be surrounded by people who don't cope with stress well, equipment that fails, other events that get in the way of performing in, elite, in an elite fashion. But you need to rapidly assess the wants and needs of the people around you and align those wants and needs with yours. And by doing so, you can achieve a task some task that may be the best accomplishment or effort anybody's ever had in their career. You can inspire them to do that. Carla awakened. In several days, we extubated her, removed her tube, and she began to speak, and she was alive. About a month later, she came to my office, and she smiled and it was the most beautiful smile. Not because she was beautiful, she was, but because my neurosurgeon brain knew that I had saved her facial nucleus, the nucleus that supplies the power to her face. She made a wonderful recovery. You know, it's been said that vision is seeing what is invisible to others. You can use cognitive dominance, the neurosurgical rules that sharpen cognitive dominance in your life, in your business. And I'm happy to share with you two neurosurgery rules, and I hope they help you in your business, in your life. Thank you.